This is a presentation of the University at Buffalo Center for the Arts. on behalf of the University at Buffalo community. We are all delighted you could join us here today for this historic occasion as we welcome His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama Tenzin Gyatso, the head of state in exile of Tibet and one of the most important figures of our time. Well, the Dalai Lama's commitment is to all sentient beings and all universes. And that's a very comfortable ground for him to be. That's who he is all-inclusive to save everyone in all the universes. Big job, but that's, that's his commitment. And for lifetime after lifetime after lifetime until it's done. I would like to make clear that basically we are same human being, mentally, emotionally, physically also. So, I consider I'm nothing but just one of you. His message is very simple. Uh, well, most religious messages are, you know, sort of, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, love people, you know, do not be violent, that sort of thing. But I've never met a human being that's the first one that truly practices what he preaches and is without any guile or without any, any agenda other than to alleviate suffering. <laughs> His Holiness is like for a Tibetan who are in exile, you know, he's like a figure, father figure for all of us. Like we are around like 130,000 Tibetans, so he's our leader, you can say father, to guide us. Now, there's another hat that he has, which is the Dalai Lama, and his commitment to the Tibetan people, to Tibetan form of Buddhism, to the culture of Tibet, and what that means not only to the Tibetans, but what it means to the rest of the world. And the Losaling monks, you know, I'm sure feel the same way. It is our hope that the creation of the mandala will contribute to healing and harmony to this area. Well, the monks brought something very special to the visit. They're gentle. Um, they abhor violence. They also represented a, a kind of a face of Buddhism. Here are people who have devoted themselves and their lives to, to this religion. But to be honest, the first time I saw them from a distance, I, I laughed because I didn't know exactly. But they, they were so steadfast and such, and I, I love the chanting in particular, because it's just, it's so beautiful, because the multi-tonal uh, sounds and, and tones are just, I mean, you just close your eyes and you become part of a new world. added color, they added variety, they, they helped form a backdrop for this marvelous man who was um, among us. We are honored to be here and to share one of our most important cultural and the spiritual arts form with you. A mandala is a, it's a two-dimensional representation of a multi-dimensional universe. And you can think of it as an architectural plan seen from above. So it has all sorts of wonderful teachings in it and symbolism, but it also has an effect on the mind. The mandala is actually like a, 
uh, it's a meditation aid, really. Monks will begin to draw the lines for design of the mandala. They are drawing the precise order as outlined in the Buddhist scriptures. Once the lines are completed, the monks will begin to pour scent onto the design, starting from the center and working outward. The mandala, I thought, would create opportunities to involve the community, that is, the UB community and beyond, so that people could experience what they were doing and get some appreciation for how much discipline and training alone went into the creation of one of these beautiful pieces. 9.30 is the mandala presentation on the main stage here. So if we, if we did that, we've got 45 minutes. I really want to take some pictures of the mandalas, and I was excited about that. Being an architect and someone who knows what it's like to spend a lot of time on um, uh, detailed work, it's the process that was fascinating to me. The little instrument's called a chakpu, and they scoop up in the open end different colored sands. And then the chakpu has like a, uh, ridges on the top, and they can rub two of them together, and the vibration allows them to control the rate at which the sand falls out of this little pinhole. You hear this wonderful kind of sound, this rasping sound, but it's kind of pleasant, a metal on metal as they're depositing uh, the sand. The idea of spending those hours upon hours uh, and just getting every grain of sand placed just so and being able to have that be all that's, that your mind is focusing on in, the, in, in a way of focusing a meditation. There was no uh, coffee and donut break. There was no uh, idle chatter. They had a mission, and they worked. The process, their precision, their skill, and their total dedication to the task. While making the mandala and having the Buddhist, uh, the monks chant, having a music around, was such a soothing experience. I, I'm not meditating, but I have this feeling that I forget about the rest of the world, like, you know, I'm just like focusing on this and getting like, like kind of a peace and calmness, you know, deep inside your heart. People recognize that there was something there, something very ancient. We're, we're looking at a religion that's more than 5,000 years old, perhaps 8,000 years old. So. I think people began to wonder, is there something here that we should explore? And I think there's something about Buddhism that we, even people who don't know much about it, instinctively are drawn to that, that we are all deeply connected. The Buddhists teach very much that it's the experience, it's what we do, more than any belief that we particularly hold on to. What's important is to become a warm, sincere human being with a warm heart. Tibetan landscape is very much a part of this form of Buddhism that they've evolved. The land itself has been, has been blessed in a very special way. But there are policies that have been in place since the early 50s to destroy the Tibetans. Life has become progressively more marginalized for Tibetans uh, in their own country. Certainly in the big cities, the, the Chinese are totally dominant there now. Um, the ability to gain a good education, health care, business opportunities is minimal now for Tibetans. In Tibet, you don't have freedom at all. Like, you cannot talk about Dalai Lama. So how miserable that would be. You know, I admire Dalai Lama, I admire Gandhiji. I can talk about, I admire Martin Luther King. I can talk about them, Mother Teresa. 
But in Tibet, you can't talk about who you admire. Well, you know, the, the, the original Jaipung Lhasa Ling uh, monastery was destroyed during the Cultural Revolution and utterly destroyed, as were 6,000 other monasteries and, and nunneries. So these monks and nuns are coming out and, and living in exile now. Lhasa Ling has been rebuilt in uh, the south of India in a settlement area there. Primarily, they're here to teach reality and to teach us about expansion of mind and expansion of heart. The other side of that clearly is to talk about their national situation. I've met many Tibetans now and some of their great teachers. I've never heard one word of hatred towards the, the Chinese, even the Chinese army. And every single one I've met has had someone in their family who was killed, who was tortured. It's an amazing story. It's not about Tibet. It's not about human rights violation in, in, in Tibet. It's about humanity. It's about you as a human being, how you treat the other human being. This is a culture uh, which is very, very rich and which has many universal values, which I think are important to us. The, the, the one that I think perhaps is the, is the most important is the abhorrence of violence. Now we sh uh, it is wrong to expect through war, through violence, some positive result, some achievement, I think difficult. So therefore, only practical, realistic method to, to solve problem is through dialogue. Talk. Someone said that China tried to smash Tibet, but Tibet was like a ball of mercury. You know, they hit it with a hammer and little balls went all over the place, all over the world. The Tibetans have responded to this attempt of, to destroy them and their culture with sharing it all around the world. What you are about to experience is the authentic sacred temple music and dance of Tibet. spectacle from many of us who were hearing and seeing this for the first time. And I think the Tibetans have gone through the same process. To them it's not a spectacle, it's something that's deeply spiritual. And part of their, their intimate most practice. They believe that the rituals and dances and music that go on in a monastery actually harmonize and stabilize that particular area and lessen disease or ward off disease, make the crops good. I knew that the uh performance itself would be fascinating, very interesting in terms of the way they play their, uh, their instruments and their singing, the multiphonic singing. Each of the monks sings three notes at a time, thus essentially singing in chords. Yeah. 
It's very elemental. It's almost like it sort of connects with the elemental forces, whether it's lightning or thunder or earthquake or waves crashing, the wind. Tibetan Buddhism is distinguished because it has some methods that, for historical reasons, didn't make it to several other Buddhist cultures. So they have something unique. This is a demonstration of the monastic debate. Student monks debate in this manner for five or six hours a day as part of their training. Understanding the arguments of a specific philosophical point of view, learning that inside out, and then refining it more, moving on to the next one. Learning it, feeling it, acting it out, you know, these debates are very physical. It was very intense and um, uh, uh, physical and emotional and intellectual, and I was wishing so much that I could uh, understand their language to really uh, get right into what was going on. Now we will bring you Singi Karcham, the Snow Lion Dance, to create a healthy and harmonious environment where all beings, including animals, rejoice. We all have basic needs, whether it's to express ourselves uh, through dance, through laughter, through some sort of visual creation. Those are all needs we have. And to appreciate how various cultures do that, I think can only enrich us as, as people. Over the past several days, monks have spent many painstaking hours of work to create the magnificent sand painting that you see before you. I am still fascinated by let's say the design of the mandala, the, the geometry and the symbolism that I uh, only, only scratch the surface of understanding. I think people take away, they see that, oh my goodness, there's something beautiful there and they don't understand it, which is totally fine. But I think of it sort of like music, you know? I mean, you can hear Beethoven, I don't know German, but I can appreciate Beethoven. It's, it's a communication that is, is, is more than, than language. I think people recognized on a particular level that this was something historic and that they, they might not ever have this opportunity again. To see the beauty of the creation as a whole, for the time and the effort that goes into it, that's what the experience was for me. That those tiny grains of sand as, as individual entities mean nothing but that as a whole can create such beauty it was incredible. A monks will perform a ceremony to consecrate this completed mandala.
the whole root of, of almost all these rituals is impermanence. That nothing, including the self, self is not permanent. The destruction of this specific universe is very important to how the lesson that we can learn. So they take this dorje and they will like, like cutting a big pie into fourths. They'll run it through the sand. You hear everyone is gasp, like, oh, and it's just this moment of tension. And then you see that it's almost like the Red Sea's parting. That you see this, the hand just slides across, and it's just the such perfection that it. I mean, everyone's like, oh. Here was this this fabulous artifact on display that we got to see be created as a community, and. Uh, was preciously displayed all weekend, but then all of a sudden, when it was time, it was it was uh, just wiped away, um, and uh, that was just it. Just took your breath away. It really did. For the Tibetans, the art is in the mind, and this is I think it's a very important teaching. So there's no point you can grab the river and say, "Well, I have the river." The river is in the flow. It's in the movement. It's in the tr transformation, moment to moment. Uh, and and you know, these arts are very much exploring that and expressing that. To appreciate and then know to let go. And that the vision can remain in your heart, it can remain in your mind, but that you don't have to have the physical presence anymore. And that with so many things in life, uh, to move on because there will be something equally as beautiful, if not more, if you're willing to let that happen. When the Tibetan monks gave it to you, they smiled and they, like, they, they knew that they were giving something special, so they were happy that they could just, they could give something out. And so it was like a piece of them coming into our lives. So, uh, like I won't ever forget them. Like they were just so, like they were smiling and they were so happy that it was, it was a very happy moment. There would be the final ceremony, that is taking uh, elements of the mandala to running water so that it would ultimately return to the ocean, to the earth. And they pour that into the water as a blessing to everything that depends on the water in that entire watershed. So it's this vast kind of sharing. It's a, a Buddhist practice going back 2,500 years, which is called sharing the merit. It's actually not doing this for the benefit of myself alone, but I'm gonna share this with beings who weren't even here, but somehow I, I recognize I'm connected with. And that's another, just another example of how rich and also fragile the Tibetan culture is that is so clear uh, uh, how important it is to try to preserve that. Being a Tibetan, you have extra responsibility to think about, you know, talk about your culture and all, to make people aware of what's going on, you know. You know, to get their concern, at least not their support, but get their concern that there's a Tibetan culture exists in this world and it's in danger now. Tibet is important. There's something there. Personally, I believe the Tibetans have preserved methods, techniques, that um, maybe like something being in the rainforest, you know, there may be some sap in there that cures cancer. So even though the Tibetans seem very foreign, there actually are things that have, have universal value there. Well, I mean, one of the failings of us as Americans, we know so little about the rest of the world. So these are deeply important things, of course. Knowledge, knowing, listening. Listening is very important in the world. Listening to what people's problems are. That I almost look at 
um, everything, life in a different way, the world, seeing that you should look at everything with compassion and, and love. And so it's, it was just a great experience. I think the monks knew very well how to touch us. They, they were masters of that.